You're listening to In My Humble Opinion with Maxilia Robinson and Charles Lewis only on 101.3 Jams. We are joined by none other than the Honorable Dr. Cameron <laughs> Webb. <laughs> And um and man, uh thank you for joining us as always. Like we definitely do not take it lightly because somebody such as yourself self could be looking at, you know, like us little radio folks in Charlottesville and be like, nah, um you know, like y'all small change, y'all small change. Uh but I appreciate, you know, like your dedication to the community. No question. Listen, you always gotta come through for day ones, man. Charles, you, <laughs> that's right. You've been around since uh before I even decided to come back to Charlottesville is when I first connected with you. So it's always good to hang out with y'all fellas on the weekend. That's right. I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate you taking out that time um uh and you know um definitely um give the wife our love as well because uh max had mentioned earlier um you know she she shouted her out as well so um you know definitely you know send, send our love to her and um she posted online by the way speaking of the mrs dr webb she uh you know um you know was the one that that, that informed me when i saw it about you know the position this this dc yeah. like like there's some guy in dc like they gave you this job i don't know some people may have heard of him you want to tell us about yeah. that yeah well yeah she did break that news and max what's going on good to see you um so so yeah the the news that leanne broke on friday of course is that uh that i'll be heading uh to the white house to work for President Biden, Vice President Harris, mm. I, I guess I'm saying that now, even though it's not a that's not officially their titles until mm. until the, the 20th. Yeah. But even still, uh, excited to, to join that team. I'll be working on the COVID response team, and uh, and my focus will be on equity in the COVID response. So making sure that that you know Black and Brown communities, communities of color, other underserved communities get what they need. Rural communities, um, as we're you know aiming to to get through this pandemic and. And what that means is that, you know, when, when you hear the federal government say, oh, here's one point nine trillion dollars going to uh, COVID response. You know, the question we always ask in our communities is, yeah, how much of that are we actually going to see? And so, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're really lucky to have uh, an administration that centered equity at the table and, and yeah. said we want to make sure equity is, is front and center. And so um, I'm excited to do that work. I had a lot of long conversations about so what you know, what is the vision? What are you guys thinking? And they were just saying, let's let's make sure this is fair for all Americans. And, and I said, sign me up. Yeah. So, Cameron, awesome. is this one of those awesome. look at God moments? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, this is Romans 8, 28. Hey, it, 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 is, it is straight up, you know, when, when you say, uh, you know, I, and I said this from the beginning, I said, you know, God, I just want to be used. It's that that idea that from from Isaiah, the, you know, you know, the, the here am I. Right. And, mm-hmm. and wanting to be in those spaces to to be able to um, to do some good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I thought God was leading me down this path running for, for Congress over the last year and a half. And, and I said, listen, I don't know if your will is for me to win this race or what, but, mm-hmm. but you know, I'm here. I'm showing up every day and I'm working hard. And, and you know, lo and behold, the Lord's purpose for me mm-hmm. was to take that, turn that into this opportunity to mm-hmm. work not just on behalf of the 740,000 people in this district, but on behalf of 300 right. million Americans, yep. you know, bigger plans. You know, that's, yeah. that, you know, I think it, it's um, it's exciting, and it doesn't take away from how important the work here locally is, because I'm still passionate about that. But it just says that in this moment, in this season, uh, he he wanted me to be uh, doing something a little different. Well, I'm awesome. going to say, Doctor Webb, you have full permission to do a George Jefferson walk right when you walk through the doors. <laughs> you, you better make sure you hit that thing hard, because all the work you put in, make sure you got. Little bop to you when you walk in there, a little bit, little just bit. a little bit, just a little bit, not yeah. too hard. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, and um, like I, I think, I think that's a great segue, actually. Um, you know, uh, like into the crux of things because you know, uh, like one of the reasons that, that that we appreciate you and we celebrate you is because because you're one of us. You know, like let's 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 be real about that, right? And 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 so, you know, while while there are a lot of naysayers right now when it comes to you know the COVID you know 19 virus itself and now we're talking about the vaccination right um you know and i would like to think that we as a people have gotten to the point to where we have you know those those who come from us that are in these power positions in these high positions that we feel we can trust unfortunately that's not the case right um like so there's a lot of mistrust which is granted you know like we have a history in this country within the medical field um to this day there's still articles and you know giles we we, we've talked about on how there's 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 some black people who are saying that they get turned away from the hospital their doctors tell them you can just go home you'll be all right and then they and and, and their condition with covid end up you know ends up worsening so so you know um, like I know you're well versed in this, so even before we ask any particular questions, maybe you yeah. give us some of your top 
sort of myths out there like that you would like to dispel about the COVID vaccination? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think we'll start off by saying this, the distrust uh, or mistrust of government and of healthcare uh, that we see among Black Americans, that's well earned, right? And, and you said it just like Deontay Wilder, to this day, you know, this is, <laughs> this is absolutely something that has been right. ravaging our communities. You go back and, and, you know, we talk about the slave health deficit. We talk about the experimentation on Black bodies, you know, during slavery and subsequently. We talk about the eugenics movement that had a stronghold right here in Charlottesville, Virginia. We talk about, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Philadelphia Negro in 1899 talking about how critical it was that we acknowledge the differences in mortality among Black Americans in Philadelphia and just seeing across all these different areas. We fast forward to Dr. King saying of all the forms of injustice, the inequality in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. We go to 1985 with Secretary Margaret Heckler and the so-called Heckler Report that detailed all the, the disparities among Black lives in the United States in terms of health outcomes. And then we say, you know, 18 years later with this large report called unequal treatment that finally highlighted exactly how deep that that those roots go in terms of inequality and health outcomes and how some of it is rooted in provider bias right and so mm-hmm. you know throughout we know there's this legacy of black americans being uh treated unequally in the american healthcare system even when they're able to get access to the american healthcare system mm-hmm. All of that, all of those roads lead us to 2020 with that COVID, with COVID-19 kicking off and then now into 2021. And we're here, we're looking at some really sobering reality. We're looking at the reality that right now, one out of every 750 Black Americans is dead from COVID-19. That is a disproportionate impact that is tremendous. Mm. And then we're looking at the fact that finally, we've got this life raft. Is this vaccine, this vaccine that can stop us from contracting the illness that disproportionately causes us to be hospitalized and die. So then we say this Mm -hmm. vaccine, this thing that can be our life raft, is it actually good for us? Right. And that's where we start to have the conversation. Right. And I know, for, you know, we're, we're on Zoom right now, so y'all can see, you see this fresh fade, right? I was at the barbershop yesterday, <laughs> right? I was at the barbershop, and, um, and, and my barber, uh, Jamal Dow, was like, he's like, so Cam, did you get that second shot of the COVID vaccine yet? Because we've been talking about it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, yeah. So I'm now a week and a half removed from my second shot. And he's like, how are you okay. feeling? I was like, I feel 100%. I'm fine. And then uh, the shop starts talking. We shifted away from the whole LeBron versus MJ as the goat, and we shifted to COVID vaccine. And I said, well, so what's really, what's the conversation y'all are having? What are your concerns? What are your considerations? One guy said, I'm not concerned, but it's really just, I don't know that I want to put something in my body every year. Then finally, somebody says, what is in this vaccine? And that, Charles, to the crux of your question, is really what this turns on. People are like, what is in this vaccine? Mm -hmm. Right, right. First thing I'll say to you is that, like, when was like when when you take your kids to get vaccinated? When have you ever asked somebody was in a vaccine? Have you ever asked that before, right? And it's yeah. like, and the answer is you haven't because you just took it on trust. You said this is something that's got a track record and a history, and mm-hmm. supposedly it's good for my kids, so I'll use it. This is a different moment because we don't trust the speed with which it was created. We don't trust, you know, and we're just like black people are already dying disproportionately. Tell me what's in this. Yeah, and now, I think that in you detail. Go yeah, ahead. No, go can ahead. I stop you there? Because like, was that a rhetorical question, or were you really asking that question? No, no, no. I, I know it's different. I was okay. going to say it, it, it's, right. it's very different. All right. It's very different. But yeah. I, I think that I think that people see that and they're just like, so what's different? And then we're in this moment where it's been developed over one year in real time in mm-hmm. front of us while we're on social media talking about what we're reading, what we're seeing. You know, you hear things about potential ingredients in it. And so I just kind of broke it down. I was like, there are four ingredients in this vaccine. Right. It's not it's not anything crazy. There's the messenger RNA itself that just delivers that message to the to the uh, body and tells it how to fight COVID-19. Then there's some lipids that are essentially the packaging that the messenger RNA comes in. Mm -hmm. They can keep it whole because mRNA breaks down really quickly in the body. So you need that packaging so that it can actually make it to to do its job. Mm -hmm. Then you've got some salts, uh, these four different salts, and their only job is to match your body's pH. So they're also similarly, it doesn't break down too easily. And finally, some sugars. And those sugars keep the lipid particles from sticking together when it's at cold temperatures. That's all that's in this vaccine, right? And people are like, well, what about luciferase? Because I read online and such and such, right? And it's like, that's not in this, right? That's a that's a research tool that people use to see how things are entering into cells. It's been used for decades, right? But that's not a part of the actual vaccine. Mm -hmm. And, And so I think just slowly walking through all of the things, because like I said at the beginning, the mistrust is earned. And so we have to take our time brick by brick to build the trust to say, hey, take this. But here's what I'll I'll end with, because I want to hear your questions, but Mm -hmm. I'll end with this. While we are working our way through that mistrust, people are dying every single day. Mm -hmm. And you don't Mm -hmm. get vaccinated and you're good to go the next day. No, it takes a month. 
and you look at the surge in cases from Thanksgiving and now Christmas, and we know the next few weeks are going to be the worst few weeks of COVID that we've mm-hmm. ever seen. And we and we still aren't at a point where we have enough trust. So that's where I'm yeah, excited about yeah. this job because I'm like I'm here to try to help you know bridge that divide. I'm not trying to sell anybody a vaccine. I'm just trying to save lives. So. And and why Please is sure. it administered in two parts again? Yeah, it's two parts because the first one kind of primes your immune system. So your immune system's like I've never seen this spike protein from a COVID virus before. That's why we called it the novel coronavirus. For the first time, your immune system's like, what's that? I've never seen it before. And and the mRNA is telling your body, look out for this. If you see it again, make sure you ramp up an immune response. The second shot really shows your body. Your body's like, oh, that's that thing I saw three weeks ago if it was the Pfizer or four weeks ago if it was Moderna. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, I've seen that before. Let me prime, let me get my immune cells running. And so now your body's got a good rhythm on how to rev up the immune system. And then finally, if, you know, two weeks after that, four weeks after that, you come in contact with somebody with COVID, the second that virus comes near you, your body's like, nah, not only do I know what it looks like, but I know how to rev up a response to it. It's not coming anywhere near me. So that's why it's two shots. There is a vaccine that's coming down the pipeline in a couple months from Johnson & Johnson that's going to be a single shot, and we think that'll be a really effective way for us to reach some communities that are harder to reach. Mm-hmm. Now, in that regard, um, why are there so many brands? Why do they vary? Like, why why were some rejected, whereas it seems like that the, I guess, like the national standard first was the Pfizer and, and, and mm-hmm. then the Moderna one was approved? Like, so when you give those ingredients, yeah. like, what was it about the ones that got rejected? Like, for instance, I heard, I think it's the UK, where they had to stop travel mm-hmm. because they used one where a strand in it would like neg- would negatively affect um, other folks or something of that nature, but like, but theirs was a different brand. So why so many brands? Right. So here's here's the way I look at it, right? If we if we go back in time to January of 2020, and we say, oh man, this this virus is going to kill 400,000 Americans by this time next year. Somebody better create a vaccine. Mm. How many people do you want to try to create a vaccine? You want one company to try? Do you want five companies to try? Mm -hmm. We had hundreds of companies who said, who raised their hands, said, I'll try to create a vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. And so we had that race to create a vaccine. When we saw promising results, we started to spend, as the United States, started to spend dollars to help get those through and across the finish line. So we had something to fight this, uh, this virus earlier. So what happened is that mRNA vaccines, that messenger RNA vaccine, it's a new technology, even though it's been under development for about two decades. But one of the good things about it is it can be uh, manufactured faster than other forms of vaccine. It can be mm-hmm. developed and created faster. And so that's why it, those are the first ones to market, the Pfizer and Moderna. Mm-hmm. Now, the next one, the one from the UK is the AstraZeneca vaccine. And uh, and I think there are a couple of things tied together there. Now, you're talking about a different strain. That's, that's the actual virus. In terms of the vaccine, they had to halt that vaccine for a little while because mm-hmm. there were some bad outcomes back uh, late summer, early fall. They investigated those outcomes. They weren't due to the, the vaccine necessarily. So they said, okay, let's, let's keep going now that hasn't been approved in the u.s yet probably won't be until april at the earliest and so that'll be the next one online johnson and johnson's coming right there are a couple that are in a, at a point in the trials where we feel like they're the next ones up and that's just a matter of the success of the folks who've been making it to show something that works but the moderna vaccine 94 percent effective the mm-hmm. pfizer vaccine 95 percent effective this astrazeneca one right now they're in the uk they said 70 percent effective we'll see um, but again, we want to see that it works, right? And that's what we're looking for. So that's why you're seeing so many different candidates. And I think the key here is is portfolio di- diversity. You want to have lots of different vaccines just in case you say, well, you know, we don't have an ultra cold freezer, so we can't get the Pfizer vaccine. Moderna is the one that we're going to use. Or we can't do two shots because we're out in, in rural Southwest Virginia. We're going to use the Johnson Johnson vaccine because we only get one chance to get with people, right? So those are the kind of differences that you get when you have lots of different candidate vaccines. Gotcha. I know Aaron so has did a you, for you. Oh, go ahead, yeah, Max. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask that you personally or anyone that you know ex- who's taken the vaccine experienced any side effects from it? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's a great question. Um, so vaccine side effects are relatively common, but there's a spectrum of side effects, right? Mm-hmm. And so for me, every time I get a vaccine, like my flu shot and with this COVID vaccine, my shoulder's sore. That's a side effect, right? Mm-hmm. My shoulder's sore from the, at the injection site. Not something that, that you write home about. Uh, additionally, you know, I actually had the, after the first shot, I had a little bit of a headache, which was a different kind of headache than I usually get. Took some Tylenol, knocked it right out. And then I also had a little bit of like joint achiness. And I was like, oh, this is a little strange. Mm -hmm. For me, those side effects, I wouldn't even write home about it. Wouldn't break my stride. I'd go to work, no problem. Mm -hmm. My wife, on the other hand, 
After the first shot, she had a fever of about 101.8 and she was feeling really fatigued. It was gone by the next morning. So, you know, within 36 hours, fever was completely gone. Um, so she didn't develop the fever till about a day after the shot. And then the following morning, she was fine. Um, with the second shot, she actually had a fever of 102, uh, was wiped out in the bed all day. She would not have been able to go to work that day, just feeling really tired. The sun came up the next day like that. She was completely back to normal. Right. And that's the kind of, uh, you know, vaccine response that we see. And and we've said up to 15 percent of people will have that kind of a response to it. Mm -hmm. It was the expectation. And it's just because your body's it, everybody's immune system is a little different. And for her, her immune system was like, oh, you're showing me something that I need to fight against. Well, let's fight. You know, and it really got revved up. That also shows me that, you know, if she comes in contact with COVID. Her body's going to be ready for to fight it, you know, and then that'll be a good thing. And so, but again, completely back to normal by the next day, we were, we were both fine, haven't had any complications, any issues. And the symptoms that we've had, I'll just list them really quickly. So headache, muscle, muscle aches, joint aches, um, fatigue. So just feeling really tired. Uh, and then some pain at the injection site. Those are the most likely things that folks are going to get with this vaccine. Um, if you have a history of of severe allergic reactions, it's a different thing, right? We, we watch those people really closely. And after everybody gets a shot, we watch them for at least 15 minutes, 30 minutes if you've had a history of severe allergic reactions. Hey, so so Dr. Webb, so that like so that's a point that's that's come up um with our listeners as well. It's like who should take it and and is there a population that doesn't really need to take it? You know, um as far as like if let's say you're young, healthy, um, you know, um and then like you just said, like what if about about the underlying conditions? There are there people that it could have a negative effect on? And, and let me just expound on that by saying is like I am one who feels that we are over medicated as a population, you know, just, just in general. Right. Um, right. Like, so even with vaccinations, I, like I would love if, if our, if our PCP could look at us individually and say, you need this, you don't need this. Like, you know, because, because to your point of, of when we take our kids to the doctor, right. like, like I actually do question it, you know what I mean? Because I, because I, because I feel like that, like uh, vaccine injuries are something like they can happen if it's something that, that my child, you know, um, if my child's body, uh, you know, rejects. So 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 to sum up that question, are, are, are there are there certain people that don't need to take it, uh, whether it's because of underlying condition or it can negatively affect? Right. And, and I think the first group that we know about that we say, hey, be careful with this. If you have a history of severe allergic reactions, particularly to vaccines, that's somebody who at, at the very least you should talk to your doctor. Um, everybody who has any questions about whether or not they should be taking it should talk to their doctors. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the that's the first point. But I, I keep in mind that, you know, that's speaking from a point of privilege. Right. Not everybody has a doctor. Not everybody has that kind of access to care. So, true, true. so I think what I tell people is if you've got diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, some heart disease, some lung disease like asthma, this shot is designed for you. Right. Because COVID is going to do a number on you. This shot is designed to keep you from getting COVID and save your life more than likely. Mm -hmm. Right. So those individuals absolutely should be looking to. And in fact, they're prioritized. They are higher on the list in terms of when to get shots, because if you have any kind of heart disease, any kind of lung disease, then we or any kind of chronic medical conditions, you're more likely to have severe covid and bad outcomes. And so that's why we say if you've got chronic medical conditions, please get, you know, get vaccinated as soon as possible. I get a lot of questions about folks with autoimmune conditions. And, you know, you know I have family members who have or have had lupus or, or other autoimmune conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, for them, the risk isn't actually autoimmune disease itself. It's kind of the fact that they're on medications that turn down their immune system. And so the question is whether or not they would, you know, create a good immune response to the vaccine, right? And so that's, again, a conversation to have with your doctor about how to time the vaccine with your medications to get the maximum benefit. Um, I think that, you know, what we'll find by the end is that uh, everybody can benefit from this vaccine uh, as long as it's safe for them. And I think we're still, you know, investigating how safe it is for kids, that sort of thing. For young adults, keep in mind, we've seen the number of cases is risen sharply in younger Americans. That is how this virus is getting around our communities. Right. Older Americans are not the ones out moving about uh, all over the place. Younger Americans are the ones really spreading this virus and allowing it to really take hold in our communities like this. So by vaccinating them, again, that helps. Now, the COVID vaccine doesn't stop people from getting COVID, but it does stop severe COVID. And I think that's helpful because, we, you know, I've seen really sick 25 year olds and 30 year olds. So, again, another reason why people should be protected. You know, I think it's kind of akin to 
if you're traveling internationally, you, you, you say, hey, I finally you saved up this cash. I'm going to take this trip. And um, and they say, oh, well, to go to this country, you need the yellow fever vaccine. Well, like, you're like, mm-hmm. right, I want to take the trip. So, yes, I'm going to get the yellow fever vaccine. You know? Yeah, I was going to do I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, it's kind it's kind of like that in the sense that, like, hey, if we want to get our country really moving again, this vaccine is a key part of it, right? Because we're, we're trying to prevent deaths. That's what it comes mm-hmm. down to. And that's what this helps us to do. Yeah, I think Aaron had a question. Yeah, um, so obviously, um, I appreciate all the great uh, information, Dr. Webb. Um, I saw, been reading a couple articles about the UK with the new, um, a, a new strain that's coming out um, that's been really harming and, and affecting people. How are we here in the U.S. or how is the the vaccine going to be able to pivot or or work through that new strain? Um, are do you guys have the ability to kind of? understand or, or, or figure out in in season while it's happening how this vaccine is going to adapt to this new strain that they said could be here uh, possibly in March or beginning of spring and then the second question is how have you what are you guys going to do to continue to work globally because obviously like for example in certain countries like China it's like I don't want to it's like a free market there's like 10 million different vaccines out there um, are you going to adapt some of those approaches and moving forward and, and, and things of that nature well, and first off, I should say I'm speaking, you know, for me personally. So I'm not speaking on behalf of the administration in this yep, in this absolutely. conversation. But I think that, um, you know, to your first question about how the vaccine works when we have changes, every virus mutates. They mutate a different rate. And a lot of people have that question because of the flu and how uh, how influenza works. And they know right. that every year we get a different flu vaccine because the flu mutates. And, and so you don't know what strain of the flu we're going to get that year. And so... You know, the shot from last year won't be effective against the flu this year. Coronaviruses are a little different. And so what they did when they designed this vaccine is they targeted one part of uh, the coronavirus that's pretty consistent. It's called the spike protein. And if you think about like a lock and a key, uh, the spike is actually the key that goes into the keyhole. And, and the way that it works is there's a cell in your body called the ACE2 receptor. And the, the spike on a coronavirus is called corona because it's like a crown. And so it's one of those little spikes at the crown. You know, that spike goes right into the, the receptor and the ACE2 uh, cell. And it, 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 that's how it gets into the body. Mm. Now, that spike itself is pretty long. It's got lots of different proteins in it. When we say it's a variant, that means that some of the proteins have changed. And in fact, the UK variant, we call it B117, mm-hmm. uh, it's had a slight change in one of the proteins at the tip of that key that allows it to lock into that cell a little more effectively. That's how it spreads more effectively. Well, the way that the vaccine works is actually pretty, pretty impressive. It's a it's a code for the entire spike. And so instead of just focusing in on one little part, one little protein, it's giving your body, hey, this is the list of all the different proteins that are in this spike. And so let's say there's one mutation that allows it to lock into that mechanism a little more easily. Well, you, your body still has the, the, the code to look for all those other parts that didn't okay. mutate, that, that aren't part of the and so the vaccine will still be efficient for that reason until there is such a significant change in the spike protein that none of those immuno, like, uh, you know, immune responses that have been created right. recognize that spike anymore. And I don't think we have any reason to believe that. In fact, they've tested uh, the uh, the efficacy of the vaccine against that that particular strain, the UK variant. And, you know, there's a South African variant, a Brazilian variant. Right. Um, that sort of thing. So we're going to see variants. We're going to, and, and I think we're going to see those. You mentioned kind of March, April. That's when we expect because the UK variant's already here, right? It's in New York, it's in California, it's in Florida, Colorado, Connecticut, right? We've seen it all over. It's probably in every state by now. It spreads faster. What I always say is that you know we expect that it's going to become the dominant strain because of how efficiently it spreads. So we have to look out. And I was telling folks the other day. Um, this is a time for us to really buckle down on that mask wearing, right? Because Mm -hmm. when you have a strain that's less forgiving because it's so good at locking into your cells and getting into your body, Hmm. you need to wear, you need all the protection you can get, right? So it's going to be a little less forgiving for those things like, you know, not wearing a mask or indoor dining or that sort of stuff. And so uh, we've got to be really careful. That's important. important Yeah. Yeah, important to note. Yeah. Hey. So. So we. Um. We. We have questions rolling. I'm. I'm gonna try to get through these real quick. So one is. Um. Was asking you to. To talk about. Uh. Her, herd immunity. I don't even know what that is. Hopefully you do. Yeah. So talk about herd immunity. Um. Sure. Too. Uh, because we would have many shutdowns. 
Yeah, so herd immunity is really the the reason why we're doing this to, to a large extent, right? So the idea is that, um, you know, you don't need 100% of the population to be vaccinated to stop a virus from spreading. You really just need some percentage so that the virus doesn't have enough places to go after a while. It's just like, well, I can't get them, can't get them, can't get them. And eventually, for a virus to stick around, it has to infect at least one other person uh, plus Plus, so more than one other person every time it, it comes through. So I think the idea of herd immunity, we we have various estimates, but we think we have to get about 70 to 80 percent of the population who aren't at risk of, of, of the disease, uh, who are immunized against the disease. Some people get immunity having had a prior infection um, with COVID, and we know that immunity only lasts a little while. Um, you know, with the number of Americans who've already had COVID, right? And we know we've got millions of Americans who've had COVID. Um, and with the number who are who are immunized, we still are nowhere near that 70% threshold. We don't want uh, to get to that 70% threshold by people just naturally getting COVID just because the, the number of people who would die if it came down that way, right? Mm-hmm. And so the vaccine at least helps protect against severe COVID and protect against death. And so that's where herd immunity comes in. We say, well, we've got to vaccinate our way to herd immunity. And that's why, you know, you've heard um, President-elect Biden saying 100 million shots in 100 days. So that tells you by April 30th, that's almost a third of the American people are going to be vaccinated. And then that's huge because it helps prevent that spread of the virus. And and hopefully we exceed that number. Right. Hopefully we go even beyond that. Um, And what I'm always looking to is I'm saying you say 100 million people. You can find 100 million people, but are you getting the communities that are hardest hit? There's been this graphic circulating of Washington, D.C., and it shows where people are dying on one side, and then it shows where people are getting vaccinated on the other, and it's completely different communities, right? And and I think that's where we say some of that is that vaccine hesitancy. It's folks saying, I don't know if I want to get that, but some of it is just a lack of access. You know, there are three parts of vaccine hesitancy and 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 one of them is is convenience can i actually get this and so we've got to make sure we're designing a you know an immunization program that allows everybody to have access but yeah that's how we have to get to herd immunity we want to get there as quickly as possible because you know yes we're kind of in the heat of it right now but if we can cut this thing off and stop the spread of this virus then we have a real chance of having you know more and more of a return on normalcy as 2021 wears on Awesome. I was thank, thank you for that. Uh, one, so um, just one more. And I know Jow's had one. Um, so the, the, the listener states, um, I've heard a lot of people say since I've had COVID or suspected that I had it, I can't get it again. For those who prayerfully have not gotten the virus, if they get the vaccine, what is the probability of their immunity to the disease? Also, yeah. also, does the vaccine prevent transmission to others if someone who had it and recently got over it gets vaccinated, then goes out around other people or the reverse is asymptomatic and gets vaccinated and is around people? Yeah. So so really good questions there. Um, so first thing that we learned pretty early on. Uh, in the pandemic was that you can get infected with COVID more than once. And so, you know, that's that's a little bit challenging because somebody has an infection and we hope, okay, they're out of the list of people who could get infected. No, with COVID, that immunity doesn't last long enough for you to to not get infected again. That's where the immunity we have from the vaccine is actually better. So for folks who've had COVID before, if it's been at least 90 days, which is our recommendation, then we say get vaccinated to make sure that you have a longer immunity to this. Now, now the question here is, does the vaccine prevent people from getting COVID, period, right? What we know that it does is it keeps people from dying. It keeps people from having severe COVID, so getting hospitalized. It keeps people from being symptomatic. But we don't have you know complete proof at this point that it keeps people from getting infected at all. And that's important, right? Because we know that 40% of people who get COVID have no symptoms whatsoever. But for that other 60%, Mm -hmm. COVID does a number on you. And for some people, they have it for months. And so for that 40%, they're like, oh, okay, you know, I didn't even know I had COVID. I just, you know, got an antibody test and found I had it. Well, that's more of what people would experience. Here's the thing. If you have an asymptomatic infection, you can spread it to your grandma who hasn't been vaccinated, right? Mm -hmm. And so... The, the key here is people still are going to need to wear masks. They're still going to need to physically distance until we can keep the, vac- the, the virus from spreading, period. Now, the Moderna vaccine, they've actually said they think that it actually uh, could prevent asymptomatic spread. And they said there was a trend toward people not even getting infected. The AstraZeneca vaccine, they're saying the same thing. It's a matter of how they designed the study. Were they testing for that? The Pfizer study wasn't testing for whether or not people get asymptomatic spread. They were mm-hmm. testing for whether or not people are dying or oh, getting yeah, hospitalized right. or getting sick. So 
I think, you know, it's possible that we may learn uh, in the near future that, hey, these vaccines actually stop people from getting infected, period. Um, and that would be great. But at the very least, we know they stop people from from getting really sick with COVID. And that's really important. And so I think that that's that's kind of what we know. We know that we're still going to be using some of these public health measures, even with uh, vaccine going out in our communities. But but I think we got to be really careful um, because I think people want people want to get the shot in their arm, then go like throw a party. Right. And be like, we're all <laughs> Listen, that's um, all I hear. <laughs> no, man, doesn't work like that. Doesn't work like, you gotta, gotta stay safe until the vaccine's not spreading in our community anymore. Right. And that's when you can be like, okay, when there's no spread in our community, right. that's when we can we can get back to some semblance of normal. All right. Giles, did, did you still have some or did he answer? I have so many questions. It's been amazing, <laughs> Dr. Webb. We have to thank a part you so much. For thank you for doing this, though. Just yeah. um, and also thank you for running for Congress to do this Absolutely. because we need people who understand this world and understand medicine up there. I guess I had a big picture question, which is with this initiative that the um, new administration is rolling out for, 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 for COVID response, do you think it builds a framework for a, an actual public health system in our country um, uh, going away from this? Because you said most people don't have a doctor and that kind of kept echoing in my ears. How are we going to be a healthy country when most people don't have a doctor and their, their, main, their main orientation is to avoid the doctor? Right. When, you know, um, hmm. and so I'm just wondering if you think that this builds a runway for people like you and for a, a federal initiative to start building what would look like some type of public health system that means people have doctors who they yeah. trust. And, and, and Giles, you know, I think, again, I, the, the lawyer in me, alarms going off. It's like I'm always careful not to speak on behalf of the administration. Sure. I understand. Myself. No. But but I think that what I would say is that uh COVID-19 has changed the game, it's changed the game in terms of what we know about the American healthcare system and how we are all so interrelated, all so impacted. And I've I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, even from back when I was campaigning for Congress, you know, to, to now heading into the administration in a, in a pretty different capacity, working on COVID and working on equity. We realize just central to the ability for, po- for folks to get and stay healthy, you got to have access to care. And so I think that it, it does highlight that conversation. Um, and then, like you said, public health infrastructure I think the the proof is in the pudding. Over the last year, we've just seen we don't have an adequate public health infrastructure. We don't have the workforce. We don't have the the ability to rapidly respond to potential crises. Right? We just weren't prepared. What I do know is that this administration, they're definitely keeping that stuff in mind. What what um what President like Biden said the other day when he kind of announced his American rescue plan was that first we're talking about rescuing our nation from the grips of this pandemic. Like that is that's what we need to do. That's that's getting vaccines in arms, you know, getting shots in arms. That's making sure that people have the resources necessary uh, to to kind of make it through day by day. Um, there's a whole recovery element of this too. That, uh, you know, additionally with President like Biden has said that he's going to be rolling out as well. And so you've got recovery from all of the the pain and the challenge economically and socially and from a health perspective that this this uh, pandemic has caused. And then there's the, hey, America, wake up call. Are we do we have the kind of systems necessary to have a healthy nation? And I think that um, a lot of people can answer that question with a I don't think so. It's not equitable. It's not fair. Everybody can't say that, you know, our neighbor has access to the care they need right. and when they need it. And so that can take a lot of different forms. But but I do think you're going to see a resurgence of those conversations. I think putting my like, you know, political pundit hat on, uh, we got a, a different moment because we have. Um, you know, I, I, of course, I'm a Democrat and I ran as a Democrat and we've got a Democratic House. We've got a Democratic Senate now, we've got a Democratic president. Hey, and, no and all three have been saying we need access to care for folks. So right. it looks like a good moment to to say, what does that look like? How do we get that done um, in these, these next two years? I think that you know, the urgency right now is getting through this COVID crisis. But I think, you know, it would be it would be folly not to look at how we can expand access in this moment, too. Yeah. Uh, Miss Max, kick it to you. Yeah, I have two questions for you, uh, Dr. Webb. So I have uh, children between the ages of four years old to 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious um, just what your thoughts are in terms of vaccinating children. Um, I know for a long while they were talking about kids were less likely to get it. When they did, they were less likely to die from it. Um, Are they even turning children away because they aren't, um, they just don't fall in that category of their health being more compromised, you know? 
Yeah. Um, so that's the first question, vac- vaccinating children. And then the other actually comes from a reporter with Charlottesville Tomorrow. Um, and I believe um, she's heard that UVA is doing well with um, administering the vaccine, but that the local health department um, is um, facing some some challenges. And so she's just wondering, is that staffing issue? Is that a supply issue or what the scenario might be? Yeah, I could yeah. just say, I think we were hearing that the hospital is doing a thousand a day and mm-hmm. that the health district is not, you know, there yet, although the systems are interrelated. So it was kind of like, well, what's going on there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'll start, I'll start with the vaccines and children question. And I think that, um, you know, Ms. Max, the first thing to know is uh, we don't know. Uh, we uh, okay. when, the, when the studies were designed for the Pfizer vaccine, children weren't included. It went from 16 and up. Um, when, in, you know, 16-year-olds, we know 15 to 18-year-olds, they behave kind of like adults when it comes to COVID in terms of, you know, they're, they're similar to a 25-year-old. Their body, they may end up with some symptoms from it and whatnot. Mm-hmm. They don't tend to get as sick as older adults or folks with chronic medical conditions, but they can get some of those other symptoms. Um, but... You know, the, the vaccine trials didn't include kids on the front end. Moderna started adding in kids uh, in their in their trials. So they had kids ages like 12 to 15. And I think Pfizer started adding in some kids as well. Mm-hmm. And the hope, um, you know, and I've, I've heard this from several people, is the hope is that, you know, we're enrolling some older children now. They're going to start enrolling some toddlers and younger kids later. And the hope is that, you know, it's very possible by the end of the summer, we might have, uh, you know, vaccines going to kids as well. Mm-hmm. You know, that that could be a good thing. We know that um, interestingly, you know, kids are usually ones passing colds and and flu around households. But with COVID, it doesn't seem like they are the ones who are usually bringing it into a household and making everybody sick. It's Mm -hmm. kind of a unique dynamic. Um, But just the same. We never know how a future variant may work. We know that the the uh, UK variant, there are some early indicators that look like, hey, you know, more kids might be getting sick just because it spreads more visually, it spreads to more people. And so we're seeing more kids getting sick and that's going to be the dominant variant by late March, early April. Um, you know, I think that, that it's just like, okay, we don't want kids getting sick, mm-hmm. like period, hard stop. We, we don't want kids getting sick. And so I think that there is a lot of interest in figuring out how to protect the kids as well. Um, we also know there's a multi-inflammatory syndrome, uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in kids, MISC, that, that causes a lot, of, a lot of challenges. It happens very rarely, um, but if you see higher numbers of kids getting COVID, that rare outcome is going to happen to more kids, and we don't want to see that. So, so again, you're, you're going to see a lot of interest in, in kids, and I think that by hopefully mid to late summer, uh, you might see some efforts to vaccinate kids as well. Um, To the second question about about kind of the vaccine rollout, Um, you know, I've been, I'm pretty aware of what's happening at UVA and I know that, um, you know, certainly this was phase 1A and and we haven't spoken about this yet, but this idea of a phased rollout of the vaccine, it was rooted in this idea that we want to prevent unnecessary deaths. But the first phase, phase 1A was really what we call the jumpstart phase which was trying to get healthcare professionals vaccinated first and folks who work in healthcare settings. And, um, and the reason is that we need healthcare, our system to, to stay afloat. We can't have healthcare workers getting sick and dying because we'll have nobody to take care of the population if they got sick, right? right. So we wanted to get them vaccinated first. That phase 1A here in Virginia, that's about 500,000 people. You know, so, mm-hmm. so we wanted to make sure they were all vaccinated and good to go. That's not just doctors and nurses. We're talking about transport. We're talking about food services. We're talking about everybody, the techs, everybody who makes a hospital run. They all needed to have access to that vaccine. And I'll tell you, you know, we've gotten, we've had some success at UVA in terms of getting folks vaccinated, but there's always more room to go. There's still, we still see the same challenges of vaccine hesitancy in certain parts of, of the population. And so we still need to get more people vaccinated, but, um, but, you know, doing a good job of of getting shots in arms. And I think that's good for our community, especially because it's such a big employer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't have as much uh, inside. I haven't been involved in the conversations over the last couple of weeks um, with anybody from, from the Blue Ridge Health District. That's the new name for the Thomas yeah. mm-hmm. Um Because, uh, you know, I've been, I've been, you know, doing, doing work more, you know, federally, but I think that, um, you know, I know that their intent and I've seen their posts on social media, on Facebook and on their page, you know, they're revving up to, to get to phase 1B, which is getting to, um, you know, beyond just our healthcare uh, professionals, healthcare workers, but getting to all essential workers, which are our teachers, our child care, our transportation, our, you know, food service and delivery, all of those different dynamics, every essential service, they fall into phase 1B. 
all adults over the age of 65, they fall into phase 1B. Every adult with chronic medical conditions, they fall into phase 1B. So we're heading into the part where you really get the big swell. And so I think that's a that's a different dynamic. It's one thing for a you know for healthcare systems like you know UVA or Sentara Martha Jefferson to be able to vaccinate their you know their healthcare um, you know workforce. That's a, it's a different dynamic. I think now we're looking at how this uh, plays out with the larger population. I know the Blue Ridge Health District has been um, building to that and making sure they have, um, you know, max vac- vaccination sites. I know Governor Northam talked about it the other day. I know that, um, you know, they're planning on using some some larger localities, uh, some larger spaces locally. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's a little early to say that um, it's not going well for Blue Ridge Health District because we're really about to see in this phase 1B how the public health vaccination effort really ramps up and, and really does its job. But um, but I would I would just keep a close eye over the coming days and weeks. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks. Wow. Um, I think this is a good uh, stopping point uh, for now. And and I know, Cameron, every time I tell you it won't take that long, but you have such fruitful conversation. <laughs> you know, so it's not even my fault, brother. Like, you, you just have so much fruitful conversation. It was me. I, I'm, a, I'm a Gemini. I like to talk. But, but you know, the thing is, I think it's so important for us to get this information out. Yes, in, in, I, I look for every opportunity to answer questions. You know, Dr. Tyson Bell, who's an infectious disease doctor, critical care doctor at UVA, he and I have been doing a weekly uh, COVID yes. update every Monday night uh, from 7 to 8 on Facebook Live. And so if you went to facebook.com forward slash doctor, that's D-R Cameron Webb, um, every Monday night, 7 to 8 p.m., uh, we just do Q&A for an hour. Awesome. And we just... I think it starts with listening to people, hearing where they are. Some of it, it's a mix of just questions and then people dropping in the comments their own experiences, their own concerns. And so it's so important for us to have this conversation as a broader community. Make sure that we're all um, getting our questions answered because you you can't expect people to just fall in line. Uh, This wouldn't be America if people didn't have some pushback. And so it's important that that people take their time to to make sure that they they know, um, that they feel safe, they feel comfortable. Um, what I what I hope doesn't happen. I hope that uh, we avail ourselves. We make every opportunity to answer those questions now, mm-hmm. right? Because you know there are a lot of people who are like, oh, I'll, I'll wait. I want to see some other people vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, while you're waiting, you might get sick. You know, my mom got her shot yesterday, and I always tell people that my mom got her shot yesterday. And so you need to look no further than my love for my mama. And no, I would not mm. let my mom take a shot that I didn't feel 120. Like, listen, I'm young, I'm healthy. I'll, I'll take on a little bit of risk. My mom's 65 years old. Sorry, mom, I didn't mean to tell you. Age, but, but my mom's Shout out to mama, man. Shout out to mama. I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a whooping. Um, <laughs> but I wouldn't let her. I, I would never advise her to get something that I didn't have complete confidence confidence in its safety and its efficacy. Right, right? Right. And so when she came to me and she said, hey, let's talk about this. And she's on those Monday night uh, Facebook lives every week. But when she was like, hey, what, what do you really think about this? I gave her my full unqualified support for her getting this vaccine. And my dad's going to get his. He's not 65 yet, but mm-hmm. but he's going to get his soon, too. And I think it's so important that people realize, like, listen, my loved ones, I'm recommending it to them, too. It's not just because yeah. I'm part of some machine. I want I want, you know, the, the public to, to be sheep and follow something is because I want my parents safe and I want them here for next Christmas. We couldn't do this Christmas. I want them here for next Christmas so mm. that we can, uh, we can spend it together. So that's why, that's why my parents got the vaccine. My mom got hers. My dad's getting his tomorrow. Um, and I hope it's kind of one of those next steps in our family getting back to them. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So, so y'all heard it. Tune in tomorrow awesome night information. With, with doctors, uh, Webb and, and bail. Yeah. Max, want to take so, us out? It, well, listen, I'm just now checking my texts, oh, yeah. um, um, and it says, ask Dr. Webb about gems. So can, he's I, laughing. I so I can, I can do that one because I, I love going to the gym. It's a part uh-huh. of the gym and it's part of what keeps me sane. Um, and the gym that I attend, they've done a pretty good job of putting some safety measures in place. But um, but again, as I've been saying, this new strain, a little less forgiving. Gyms are the kind of places. They're indoor, enclosed spaces. Uh, people are breathing hard. Those are the kind of spaces where a virus like this can spread, right? So you got to be wiping down machines. If you are the kind of person who's willing to go to a gym, then you better be one of those most careful 
always wear my mask, mm. wipe down every surface, right. stay 10 feet away from everybody. You, If you're that kind of person, then yeah, I can see you making a gym work for you. But understand that these next couple of weeks and months, um, you know, you, you got to be extra careful. So, I mean, I'll be full disclosure. I do still go to the gym. I, I am also pretty careful at the gym. And I think that, um, you know, I feel more comfortable at the gym now that I've had the vaccine as well. I, I just <laughs> to be candid. And so, um, yeah. so gym, gyms have always been one of those spaces that we say like, Hey, we want people to get exercise. It's good for mental health. And, and I, I, I try in every one of these conversations to, to hit on mental health. Cause let's not lose track of the fact that that's a huge part of this dynamic and people need to protect themselves and protect their mental health, especially with all the isolation. But, but keep in mind, you know, the gym is a place that there is some risk. And so make sure if you're there, you are ultra careful, uh, and, and kind of going above and beyond to follow all protocols. All right. awesome. Thank you. I appreciate awesome. that. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Webb, as always. And, um, you know, until next time, man, stay safe and keep grinding. You are an inspiration, you know, um, to us, man. And, um, you know, uh, man, yeah. So um, much success in, in this new year, um, you know, w- with all the new endeavors. Until we see you yeah, next you time, appreciate it. That's right. Thanks for having me. Y'all take, take care. care. All right. Take care. <laughs> Bye. I met your family. We will be right back. And that was Dr. Webb. Uh, Such a great conversation. Yeah.